get your syllabus as soon as possible okay only then we'll be able to proceed in a proper manner okay okay sir sure sir sure, by the way the conversion of scales uh, although this is not taught in the school but we did learn about few basic things like how we can convert from celsius to kelvin or from kelvin to celsius okay about conversion of fahrenheit to height to celsius or celsius to fahrenheit or for conversion between kelvin and fahrenheit that is not something you have to study in this class so we are will be skipping that okay now when we look at the uh boiling temperature and the freezing temperature of the water in the celsius scale so it is namely 0 degree celsius and 100 degree celsius so at that temperature water will be boiling getting it now so that is the boiling point of the water right so at boiling what we also like you would have heard of the term evaporation also so how is evaporation different with boiling how is it different with the boiling is there any difference between the two ever thought about this hmm? ever thought about this thing yes pinka and you know, goes like k see we have taken two samples of water so my question is that one of them is going through evaporation and one of the water is being boiled so it is being boiled so how those two things are different from each other ever thought about this uh, the basic difference let me tell you that the basic difference is that evaporation only occurs at the surface of a given liquid and it can occur at any temperature while boiling occurs throughout the entire liquid and it will occur only at a specific temperature of 100 degree celsius meaning that in boiling it's a bulk phenomena meaning that the entire liquid here basically what is happening now that it is boiling is happening throughout the entire liquid getting it and it is happening at a specific temperature and it's a fast process of conversion of water from the liquid to the gaseous state but evaporation it's a slow process it only happens from the surface like at any given point only this much only the water at the surface will be converting into water vapor getting my point what i'm trying to make here yes so while in the case of boiling whenever whenever water is boiled in kettle what do we see that the whole uh, part whole water is in movement huh you can see the difference between the boiling and evaporation getting it now so evaporation takes place only for the from the surface while boiling the entire liquid will be uh, in movement so boiling happens in the entire liquid okay also like evaporation can happen at any given temperature but it should be more than 0 degree celsius okay now evaporation will happen above 0 degree celsius but uh, boiling only occurs at 100 degree celsius so that is the difference here. okay anyways now when we look at the temperature boiling and the freezing temperature in the fahrenheit that is respectively 32 degree fahrenheit and 212 degree fahrenheit in the fahrenheit scale okay and how do we name this scales huh? like fahrenheit scale was named after a scientist daniel gabriel fahrenheit exactly daniel gabriel fahrenheit okay now he was a physicist after whom this scale was named okay like he gave this temperature scale in the year 1724 so it was named after him similarly the celsius scale was given by by anders celsius he was a person by the name of anders celsius just let me write down this thing like the celsius scale it was given by anders celsius so after his name the name was given okay in fact he not only did this work of giving the celsius temperature scale but he was also a astronomer he was a astronomer also he had other contributions also getting it up so he gave this celsius scale sometimes the celsius scale is also called as centigrade sometimes this is also called as centigrade centigrade scale c e n t i g r a d e l c l a so in old text textbooks so you might find this name also if you happen to go through some old textbooks so their centigrade name was also used getting it 
and this was the Fahrenheit. So as the person's name was Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. This was given by Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. Okay. The water boils at a temperature of 212 degree Fahrenheit while it freezes at 32 degree Fahrenheit in this. Then you have the Kelvin scale. In this water's freezing point is 273 Kelvin while boiling point is 373 Kelvin. That is the thing. Okay, we have one question. Like we did learn about conversion between Celsius and Kelvin. So this one is uh, relatively simple. So you guys do this one, then we'll be moving on to the next thing. Convert. Convert Celsius uh, from Celsius into Kelvin. We have to do the conversion here. Okay. Sir, how much was zero degrees into Kelvin? How much is zero degree into Kelvin? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. okay, we'll be doing that. Okay, we'll be converting zero degree into Kelvin also. Basically, zero degree in Kelvin, like uh, as we know, it's 273, basically. Okay, sir, thank you. To be specific, 273.15. If you were to count the decimal values also, it's 273. 0.15 Kelvin. Okay, you had shared your syllabus now. Uh, was you had shared your syllabus. While Priyanka hasn't got her syllabus, but you have now. You had the heat, you have motion and time, nutrition in plant, nutrition in animal. Yeah, zero degree is equal to 273, but you have to convert 16 degrees Celsius here into Kelvin and animal fiber is there wool and animal fiber and wool is there acid based on salt is there okay mm, that is correct Prayanka your calculation is incorrect it's not too hard now it is correct so that will be 289 Kelvin in uh, 16 degrees Celsius will be equal to this. I, I made by mistake. Okay, okay, no issue. Okay, so we have some more questions, but as it is related to Fahrenheit, so we are not going to do that. But there's one important thing I would like, to, uh, I think you guys should understand, like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, there's a temperature there's a temperature at which Fahrenheit and Celsius scale are equal. Like if I were to tell you guys this thing now, like the foreign, the temperature at which the Fahrenheit and the Celsius scale would be same is equal to minus 40 degrees Celsius and minus 40, uh, minus 40 degree Fahrenheit. Meaning that if you have taken, let us say you have taken the Fahrenheit scale, okay? And you have taken the degree Celsius scale. So ever thought about this thing at which point both of the, the temperature in them will be equal. So if the degree Fahrenheit has a temperature of minus 40 degrees Celsius now, and if the degree Celsius scale has, sorry, this one should be 40 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now minus 40 degrees Celsius. And if this one is minus 40 degree Fahrenheit, so at minus 40 degree Fahrenheit and minus 40 degree Celsius, both of them have the same temperature. Getting it what I'm trying to say. Are you guys getting this important point? Yes, sir. Okay, now. So when the measurement in the Fahrenheit scale is minus 40 degree Fahrenheit and measurement in degree Celsius is minus 40 degree Celsius, both of them are equivalent to each other. That is an important thing. Okay, you guys answer these questions. Yes, Abu Bakr. Is there in the class? Okay. So the second question we did yesterday. Yeah, in fact, we did this one. We have done that one. So just do the first one. Okay, sir. Just go. That is correct.
that is correct goes okay uh, abu bakar you have an answer it you are also required to answer this one okay now write down the si unit of temperature yes Yes, that is correct. Okay, so Kelvin is the SI unit of temperature. Good. Okay. Now, based on whether a given object will allow the heat to pass through it or whether it will restrict the flow of heat, there are two types of material. One that is considered as a conductor, so it will be allowing the heat to pass through it. So metals and some other objects are usually good conductors of heat. So, like for example, copper, aluminium. silver these are some metals which are the good conductor of heat okay sometime this question will be asked that which metal is the best conductor of heat sometime this question might be asked so silver is the best conductor of heat okay now it is the best conductor of heat okay now ab uh, after silver you will be having copper this is at the first place this is at the second place getting it all of you so this is a very good conductor of electric uh, of uh, uh, heat i mean to say that is the thing now talking about insulators so there are some materials like here you can see examples of some materials like cotton rubber clay and other things which will not allow the heat to pass through it so thereby they are called as insulators air and water they are also considered as insulators of it they because they also don't allow the heat to pass through it easily materials such as wool feather and fur they also act as insulators because air is trapped inside their fibers so why in the winters the the woolen clothes keeps us warm now how the winter clothes keeps us warm how do uh, how do they keeps us uh, keeps us warm basically what we know that the air molecules are trapped between the fibers of the cloth and this trapped air it does not allows the heat to escape from our body into the surrounding thereby they keeps us warm getting it now like say this is the cloth we are wearing see that this is the cloth we are wearing okay and this is the air gap between the body and the cloth we are wearing and now we know that the fibers there are air molecules that gets trapped between the fibers now and those air being a insulator air being a insulator a poor conductor of heat so it does not allow the heat to pass through it so thereby heat gets trapped between the cloth and the body heat is trapped so heat is not escape into the surrounding thereby it keeps us warm getting it now so that is the thing here you can look at some of the metals like copper aluminum and gold then styrofoam plastic wood these are some insulators then talking about the transfer of heat before transfer of heat there was few important things which i would like to discuss like uh, we were learning about like in the old metric system the unit of heat was uh, calorie right as we were learning about this in earlier times the unit of heat was calorie it was the unit of heat in the older metric system nowadays we follow the si system okay so like the amount of heat that would have been required to raise the temperature of 1 gram of pure water to 1 degree celsius now let us say if you were required to raise the temperature of pure water let's say you have some pure water and if you were to require to raise its temperature let us say from 14 degree celsius to 15 degree celsius so the amount of heat that would have been required the amount of heat energy that would have been required to raise the temperature of exactly 1 gram of pure water 
by one degree Celsius, that will be called as one calorie. Getting it what I'm trying to say? Let me just define it. The quantity of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of pure water by one degree Celsius is called one calorie. Is that clear to everyone? Yes. Is that clear to everyone or not? Please let me know. Okay. Okay, good. Furthermore, when we look at heat, so heat brings in some effect in the given object. Heat will be bringing in some effect on the object, like heat leads to expansion of the object, right? Heat leads to expansion of the object. Just let me go to this page here. Huh? So heat will be causing expansion also, which we'll be learning later on. Like all the substances, whether it be solid, liquid, or gas, they will be heat, they will be expanding upon being heated. And when they will be cooled, they will be contracting. Okay. But however, the extent to which the expansion will take place will uh, will uh, will be greatest in gas, it will be less in liquid, and will be least in the case of solid. Okay. We'll be learning about that. Furthermore, we have also learned these things like heat causes change of state also. Like when you heat a solid, it melts. And when you heat a liquid, it ultimately boils and changes into the vapor state, into the vapor. Or conversely, when you cool down a vapor or you take away heat from it, it changes into a liquid. And when you cool a liquid or take away heat from it, it changes to into a solid substance. Talking about the transfer of heat. So transfer of heat can be done by three methods, namely conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction, convection, and radiation. So why does transfer of heat takes place basically? Uh, why does transfer of heat takes place? Because the thing is now, let us say that you have taken some object here. Let us say you have taken a metal object here. So why heat will be transferred from one into another of this metal object. Let's say you have taken an iron rod here. So why is it that heat travels from end A to end B via conduction? Because the particles of the iron, namely the atoms, it wants to attain a stable state, meaning that it wants to distribute the energy evenly. Like here, you are heating it. Say that one of the end is being heated. So the particles of this end acquires some energy. So thereby it starts to vibrate like this. It starts to vibrate and it will pass on the energy to the next atom. So that gains energy. And then this pass on the energy to the next atom. So in this manner, energy passes from collision of the atoms. One atom collides with the another, this one collides with this one. In this manner, heat is passed from one to the another. So what is happening? This region has like region A or the end A, let us say it has acquired the temperature of 80 degrees Celsius, for example. Right now. So the flow of energy will take place from this region having high temperature to the another region that is having a lower temperature. Let's say this is having a lower temperature of 30 degrees Celsius or let's say 35 degrees Celsius. Getting it all of you? So heat flow always happens from one place to another because when the particles of the given substance, when it will be highly energized, so it wants to distribute the energy to other particles. Okay, now because it wants to uh, attain a stable state, attain a stable state where it can uh, stay stable. So it will be transferring the energy to the other particles. That is one thing. Also, flow of this heat energy will always take place from a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature, and it will continue till both the end acquires the same temperature. Meaning that the flow of heat will not stop until both the ends acquire the temperature of 80 degrees Celsius here, for example. Getting it all of you? 
Yes or no? Yes, sir. All of you, turn your cameras on in the class. And this phenomena has been called as transfer of heat, as we have seen here. And there are three main ways by which conduction, why which transfer of heat will take place: conduction, convection, and radiation. First of all, let's look at the case of convection. So, convection it's a process of transfer of heat by the actual movement of the particles of that medium. Like we know that liquids and gases, they are the bad conductors of heat. So they are heated mainly by the, and they are heated mainly by the process of convection. Like in a solid object, like I have given the example of this solid object in this atoms cannot move right now. So they cannot leave their position. Getting it now. The solids are not to be heated by convection. They will be heated by conduction, which we'll be learning later on. But in the case of convection, what we see that the atoms are not tightly bounded. They can move freely. They can move from one place to another. In the case of gases, also the atoms are not tightly bounded. They can move from one place to another. The solids are not heated by convection, but this medium that is liquid and gases medium, they will be heated by a convection. Okay. And a medium is will always be required for the transfer of heat via convection, whether it be liquid or whether it be gas. Okay. Getting it now? So the medium is required here. So that medium has to be liquid and a gaseous medium. But if it's vacuum, heat will not be transferred via vacuum via convection. Heat will not be transferred via vacuum or via convection in the vacuum. There will be a different method. We'll be learning about that. So convection is a transfer of heat by the movement of particles. And convection is the primary mode of transfer of heat that occurs in the case of liquid and gas. How does it occur? Let us understand. Like you are boiling this water. Let us look at this animation here. Though let's say some chemical liquid is being boiled here. With the help of some burner, it is being boiled. So when it boils now, the particles will expand. It particles will expand. And as a result of that, it becomes lighter. Like the particles that are in close, uh, that are in the bottom of this kettle. So they are being more heated. The particles will expand in size like this. They expand and they become lighter. Getting it all of you. So if it becomes lighter, it will rise up. If it becomes lighter, then it light uh, rises up now. All of you had seen helium balloons. All of you would be uh, might have played with helium helium balloons. Yeah. Yes. Why does helium balloon? Why does helium balloon rises up in the sky? What is the reason behind that? Because the helium gas is lighter than air. So if a balloon is filled with helium right now, so thereby the weight of the balloon, the combined weight of the balloon and the helium gas, it is less than the air. So thereby it rises up. Getting at what I'm trying to say. So this expanded particle is also lighter. So it will be rising up. So it rises up. But as it goes up to the surface, it again becomes heavy. When it goes up to the surface, it becomes heavy and heavy objects tends to fall in the downward direction. So it will fall down to the base again and thereby it will be again heated up. So this will lead to a formation of a current system that will be called as convection current. This cycle develops a convection current. Is that clear to everyone? In fact, you guys can look at this video here. You guys can look at the bubbles that are moving upward and then again falling downward. Okay. Go also read this paragraph. When a liquid or gas is heated, it expands. As a result, it becomes lighter and moves upwards. The cooler, heavier fluid from the surroundings rushes to take its place and is heated in turn. The process continues and gives rise to a convection current through which a uh, heat energy flows and the entire liquid or gas gets heated. Okay, now. So here we are getting to see that the entire liquid will be heated by the convection current. So this was the case of the liquid. Not talking about the case of conve uh, convection current or the case of convection in the case of air also. There we had some natural examples like the case of sea breeze and land breeze. We had in fact, that you have learned about these things. 
So why this animation? Just look at what is happening here. So during the daytime, what happens? The air above the land gets warmed up and warm air, it expands, it becomes lighter, so it rises up. So if the air above the land is rising up, it will create some vacuum. It will create some empty space. So that empty space will be acquired by the heavy air, heavy air molecules coming from the sea. So those air molecules will be coming from the seaside towards the land to acquire those empty places. But as they come on the land, they are also heated up. So they also are heated up and becomes lighter. So they will also rise up. So there a conversion current is developing here. Getting it all of you? Now look at this video about the sea breeze and the land breeze. It's a sunny day at the beach. As the sun rises, the land warms up faster than the water does. This causes the air above the land to also warm up. Now, uh, before you, we continue in this video, there's an important thing to note down that land heats up faster than water, but it also cools down faster than water. So during the day, land will be more hot as compared to the water. But during the night, the land will be cooler, but the water will be warm. If you happen to go to a beach, you would be experiencing this. During the sunny day, the land will be heated up the water will be still cooler because water takes more time to heat as compared to land. But in the night opposite will be happening. While the land would be cool, the sea will be warm. Got this thing now. Air being less dense expands and rises, leaving an area of low pressure. Meanwhile, the air over the ocean is cooler. Cooler, denser air sinks over the water, creating an area of high pressure. The differences in pressure and air temperature create a convection current. Warm air over the land is replaced by cool ocean air. This air is warmed by the land and rises, and the cycle continues. Winds that blow from the sea to the land are called sea breezes. At night, the convection current reverses. After the sun has set, the land cools more quickly than the water. Therefore, the air above the land also cools down. Cool air, being more dense, presses down over the land, creating an area of high pressure. Meanwhile, because water cools down slowly, the air over the ocean is still warm. Warm air, being less dense, expands and rises, leaving an area of low pressure over the water. At night, cool air over land moves towards lower pressure over the ocean. This air is warmed by the water and rises, and the cycle continues. Winds that blow from the land to the sea are called land breezes. Okay, is that clear to all of you? You guys understood what happened basically there in this in that video? Yes, sir. Okay, so let me just sum it up. Like in the coastal region, the areas that are close by to the sea, okay, during summer, we generally observe that a breeze, a breeze will be generally blowing from the land towards the sea during the night, okay, or in the early morning also, which is called as land breeze. As we know that land is a better absorber of heat. Land is a better absorber of heat than the water. So during the day, what happens? The land gets hotter, the air above it rises and cooler air from the sea will be flowing in to take the empty space created by that. Okay, so this gives rise to a sea breeze that cools the land. That in fact cools the land. But during the night, the land radiates the heat. During the night, the land would be radiating the heat it had absorbed during the day. Also, it cools down faster than the sea. So above the sea, air is still warmer. So it rises up and cooler air from the land moves towards the sea to take its place. So this gives rise to a land breeze. Thus, we have a sea breeze during the day and a land breeze at the night. Talking about the pressure difference there. So what we saw there now that as uh, the, the wind always blows from a region of higher pressure to a lower pressure. Whenever movement of wind takes place, it will be taking place from a region of high pressure to low pressure. So when they are 
like the cool air being heavier it sinks down cool air air being heavy it sinks down this is heavy so it will be sinking down and an empty space is being created here so if there is an empty space there are less air molecules in this so the pressure will be low while here there are more air molecules the pressure will be high so because of the pressure difference air molecules will be moving from a region of high pressure to a low pressure that is also one important thing to be considered here so that was the case of sea breeze and land breeze which we have understood now there's another way to look at sea breeze like sea breeze and land breeze happens on a major scale also like you would have learned about the western disturbances or the monsoon or the south southwest monsoon winds uh, southwest monsoon winds are like they're like the seasonal winds that would be blowing from the arabian sea towards the uh, towards the india okay now and they also blow from the bay of bengal towards the indian continent towards the indian subcontinent and they will be bringing heavy rainfall to india so these winds are caused due to difference in temperature between the land mass of india and the surrounding oceans getting it and this last from the month of june to september so due to the difference in the heating of the land mass of india and the nearby oceans nearby water bodies here what is happening here you guys tell me the uh, wind is blowing from where to where from the ocean to the land so what can we consider this as when wind is blowing from the uh, from the ocean towards the land what do we call that land breeze hmm that is called as land breeze or sea breeze now when wind blows from the sea towards the land that is called a sea breeze now yes, so sir. we can apply the concept at a wider scale also okay now although there are other factors also which uh, impacts this okay now there are other things also like a, a tibetan plateau uh, the tibetan plateau will be heated up too much and because of that a low pressure is generated here in geography we'll be learning about that during the summer season now low pressure is generated above the tibetan plateau and here high pressure is generated so because of that pressure difference also wind is pulled towards india getting it now the wind blows from a region of high pressure to low pressure so it is because of the high heating of the tibetan plateau as well anyways then we have some practical applications of convection in our daily life upon based upon which constructions are done based upon which so many things are working like why exhaust fans are uh, always uh, fitted in the upper part of the wall in the upper part of the room yes abu bakar priyanka and gos you guys explain this Ms. Prinka, explain why exhaust fans are fitted in the upper part of the room, in the upper portion of the room, like in the kitchens. Why not in the uh, not placed on the floor of the kitchen, but on the top of the kitchen? Yes. Yes, anyone? Abu Bakr, what about you? Gauz, what about you? What do we know that warm air rises up now? Warm air being lighter in density, it will be rising up. So say that here I have here. Look at this here. Say that this is an exhaust fan that is fitted at somewhere top in the house. Nowadays we have um, another alternative. Okay, now this is available nowadays. But say that this is fitted at the top of the kitchen. Okay, this is fitted at the top of the kitchen because we know that warm air will be rising up. Okay, now warm air being lighter, it will be rising up. But say if it were to be fit over here, so the warm air would be rising up in the room and it will accumulate in the room and it will not be getting out of the room and the room will become warmer. So since warm air rises up, so thereby it has to be fitted at the top. Getting it now? So that is also based upon the concept of convection, and room heaters are placed on the floor of a room. Why is it so? Like, say that a room heater is placed on the floor of the room, and why not at the top of the room? We are placing the room heater. Yes. 
Yes, anyone? Priyanka, Abu Bakr, and Goss? Because what you know that the air would be uh, cold air would be down. Uh, cold air are heavier and it sinks down. It is in the bottom part of the room. So cold air will be first of all heated up. See that these are the cold air. So it heats up and it rises up. See that these are the cold air and it is after being heated, it rises up. Since it becomes lighter, hence it rises up. So an empty space will be created due to the rising of the air molecules above this room heater. Those empty space will be taken up by the nearby cold air molecules. The ones nearby cold air molecules will be going close to the room heater. They will also become heated. So that will also rise up. So this will lead to a cycle now, a cycle like this. The warm air that has gone up, it will become lighter and it will it will become heavier and it will again fall down, go to the bottom. And this will form a convection current in the room because of which the home, whole room will be heated. Understood this now. We have some other practical application of convection like this hot air or balloon also works on that same principle. Like due to this flame, the air inside the balloon is warm. So air, a warm air being, uh, being less dense, it will push the push the balloon getting it push the balloon so we due to this basically a force of buoyancy will be created force of buoyancy like for example uh, whenever a person would be falling towards the earth you know, like when a parachute person uh, with a parachute is falling towards the earth so what happens now the air molecules air molecules would be applying an upward force on the parachute so that is an by that is called as force of buoyancy. Or uh, whenever, like you guys try to put your hand, put your flat hand into the water, so you will feel an upward force on your hand. Or uh, for example, just take some cup like this and put it in the water, put in the water. Or uh, like how the boats are flowing on the water, because the water molecules applies an upward force on the boat that is called as force of buoyancy because of which that is floating. So this air balloon also floats in the water, in the air. It also kind of flies in the air because of the uh, uh, upward force applied by the warm air molecules on the surface of the hot air balloon because of which it floats, getting it. And inside this also, there will be a convection current. The air molecules over here, it will be warmed up so it will be rising up as it goes up, goes higher up. It will be cooled down. It will again fall down. Then again, it will be warmed up. And because of which a convection cycle, uh, convection current will develop because of which they will be rising up. And then while this hot air balloon has to be lowered to the ground, then the flame will be turned off or it will be, the flame will be turned off either, or its flame will be, uh, basically, uh, I would say like, a, um, basically the flow of fuel into this will be reduced so that the warm air inside this becomes cooler so that it comes down to the ground. So this is some ap practical application of convection current. So there we had learned about convection. Now we're going to learn about conduction. Now conduction will only be, be limited to solids only. While convection happens both in the case of liquids and gases, but conduction is only limited to the case of solid. Okay, so the important points to remember here in the case of conduction is that, like in the case of conduction, what happens? It's a transfer. Uh, it's, a, it's a transfer of the heat by the uh, by uh, by the process in which now two bodies, like when two bodies with a different temperature are in direct or indirect physical contact thereby heat will be flowing from the hotter end to the colder end of the given uh, given substance getting it like here the heat is transferring from the hotter into the colder end of the given substance why it is happening it is happening because of the collision between the particles here right now the particles are not actually moving from one place to another they re remain at the same place but they will be colliding with one another and because of the collision between them, they will be transferring the energy. Got this, everyone. Okay, now.
so it's a uh, conduction is a process of transfer of heat from the hotter into the colder in from particle to particle of the given medium and it's a transmission in the case of heat only in which the molecules of the solids are not moving from their position they are only oscillating back and forth about their fixed positions they are oscillating back and forth getting it now so that is the thing here hope you guys are getting it and conduction only happens in the case of um solid no it will not happen in the case of vacuum and neither in the case of liquid or the gases that is the thing also we had learned about types of conductors you have good conductors and bad conductors we have learned about those things okay then talking about some of the practical applications of conduct uh, con uh, conductors of conduction i mean to say so some of the practical applications are as far as like the cooking vessels they are made up of the metals so that they can uh, easily absorb the heat energy and transfer it to the food so that food will be uh, easily cooked okay also we know that mercury is used as a thermometric liquid as it is a good conductor of liquids so mercury is used in the um in the in the case of the what do we say in the case of the thermometer getting it so but that i think that uh, huh, so that's a liquid and that will not be counted in, in the case of this uh, conduction then talking about some other applications like the handles of the kitchen utensils will made will be made out of the plastic because they are bad conductors of heat okay so these are some of the applications of the conduction which we have yet to see you guys answer this question which of the following is an insulator out of this Sir, we should answer it. Yeah, you have to answer this. Hmm, not as correct, guys. Yes. What about others, Priyanka and Abhubakar? You guys haven't answered it. Answer it quickly. Next answer. This one also. Question number two. The process by which heat flows from the hotter into the colder end of an object. Yes, that is correct. Was for the first one that is air. Now, air is a insulator of heat. Okay, now this is an insulator. Okay, sir. Okay, now as okay. we had learned, uh, no issue. As we had learned about this, okay. The process by which heat flows from the hotter end to the colder end of an object. This only Gauss has answered this, and that is correct. By the way. You guys are also also answer this quickly. Also, like we had several examples of conduction. Okay, now there are different examples of conduction we can see. Like uh, how a uh, blacksmith would be working. Like he would be heating up the iron objects in the hot coals. So heat will be transferring up in that metal in that iron object because of conduction. So we have that example. You guys are taking too much of time. Abu Bakr, 
Priyanka, didn't we learn about the definition of this in fact moments ago? Or what did we saw in this case? Why the process of conduction heat is transferring from the hotter into the colder end? So that is con conduction, na, Priyanka. Good. Uh, now look at this question. The stainless steel pans, they are usually provided with a copper bottom. What could be the reason for this? What could be the reason behind this? Hmm, that is correct, Abu Bakr. Very good. Yes, Priyanka and Ross, all of you correct. Because copper is a better conductor as compared to stainless steel. The stainless steel, that is an alloy of iron, by the way. It is an alloy of iron that is made by mixing iron ore plus uh, nickel plus nickel plus manganese. Manganese, I think, yeah. So these things are mixed together to make a stainless steel. Okay. Okay, this one is already corrected. Just one minute. Let me clean these things. These are some of the overwritings from the previous classes that were held. You guys just give me a moment. Uh, by the way, uh, Abu Bakr, you do one thing in the chat box, write down names of all the chapters that have been taught in your school so far. Okay, now, since your teacher told you that uh, ex uh, in examination, the questions are going to be from those chapters which have been done in your school so far. Just do this thing that write Ma down. Sir, yes. sir, there's not going to be a chapter. There is, there is going to be topics. Topics in the chapter. Okay, okay. So, if it will it be possible for you to write down those topics? Yes. Or just do one thing on a sheet of paper. Write it. Like typing will take some time. Just on a sheet of paper, write down those topics from different chapters. If your teacher have told you, or if you have some idea about that, so that we can uh, discuss those things accordingly. Okay, now getting it because your exams would be in the month of September only so you wouldn't be getting it in the much time okay now so I think it is important that I should be aware of that just give me a few more seconds and I will be sharing my screen okay just one more minute Okay. Okay. So we're going to take up this question as well. So light colored clothes, they are usually preferred during which season? Oh, okay, okay, boss. Hmm. Correct. Sir, and in the chat box. Yes, Priyanka, what were you saying? In fact, the answer you guys are giving. That is correct. Yes, Priyanka, what were you saying? Hmm. That is basically summer. So acid basis on acid and basis heat transfer digestive system of ruminants. Only this much so far. Okay, okay. 
okay the flow of heat by conduction is generally observed in case of i say it in the class only no need to write in the chat box just what is it solids that is solids good okay now we come to the next mode of transfer of heat okay na that is the radiation so what we know about radiation that is the process of transfer of heat that occurs when heat is passed from a hotter object to a colder object without affecting the medium in between getting it now meaning that it can be transmitted even if the medium is not available okay like radiation uh, it can be transmitted in the form of light in the form of infrared radiation or in some other electromagnetic waves also so how it works basically that it uh, like it will be able to travel through empty space through the empty space getting it now and it will be able to pass through the transparent and the translucent mediums translucent objects also okay and through the atmosphere also so but the thing is that it cannot pass through the solid objects take the example of the sun heating the earth take the example of the sun heating the earth or this fire or this electrical appliance all the heat that is transferring here is is through the radiation in fact radiation is said to be the fastest fastest mode of transfer of heat It's said to be the fastest mode of transfer of heat okay you guys would be aware that light to reach the earth from sun just takes few minutes about 8 minutes and 20 seconds right so the heat from the sun is transferring to the earth now imagine if the heat were heat from the sun were to travel to the earth via conduction or via convection let us suppose that there was a medium between the atmosphere of the earth and the sun suppose there was a medium so how long it would have taken for the heat uh, of sun to travel from sun to earth via conduction or via um, convection just think of this you guys know that there is about 3 lakh kilometer distance between earth and sun the distance between the approximate distance between the data set about sun i think it's about between the moon i i think okay now between the moon and the earth uh, the di uh, distance is about 3 lakh okay now i think the distance uh, uh, between the distance between the earth and the sun is around uh, if i'm not wrong it is about uh, 142 million miles or somewhere around that okay like 140 or 150 million kilometers would be there getting it so just imagine the distance between the earth and the sun about 140 or 150 million kilometer that is the distance between the earth and the sun so say if you were to let us say hypothetically let's assume a hypothetical situation so you have to connect let's say you have to connect a iron rod the length should be about 150 million kilometer how long it would have taken just imagine for the heat to reach from the sun to the earth uh, why this uh, uh, why this solid object why this iron rod let's just forget about that it will basically melt and it's uh, impractical not possible let's suppose a hypothetical situation so it would have taken so many years in fact getting it guys just go spring can of worker but yes sir but in place of that the heat from the sun reaches the earth surface in fact the light from the sun reaches the earth surface just in a time span of 8 minute 20 second 8 minute 20 second and that occurs via radiation because radiation does not necessarily require a medium to travel the transfer of heat will take place even if there isn't any medium but that doesn't mean that if there is medium it will not uh, flow in the medium it will flow in the medium even if there is a medium there also heat will heat will uh, transfer via radiation so radiation is the transfer of heat in the form of rays for which a medium is not required and these waves can even travel through the vacuum that is one thing furthermore the radiation will be traveling in the form of rays in all the direction it will be traveling in this direction in this direction in this and in this also like the heat from the sun is not only uh, not only reaching the earth now it goes in all directions now 
heat rays from the sun it goes in the all direction it is heating up other planets also while in the case of conduction and convection what we have seen that they are moving in one direction only like in the case of conduction we have seen that it moves in just one direction getting it what i'm trying to say in the case of convection what we have learned that the hot air or the water molecules will be moving in the upward direction but in the case of radiation it moves in the all direction that's why if you guys were to place your hand beneath this incandescent bulb your hand will be warmed up because heat travels in the form of rays via radiation in all the directions technically if there were to be no radiation you would not feel the warmth coming would not feel the heat coming from this incandescent bulb if you were to place your hand below this getting into guys if you were to consider the case of radiation and convection but since heat here is traveling via radiation also and radiation waves travels in all the directions that's why when you place your hand beneath this you feel the warmth so from the discussion so far have you guys understood this what we have discussed here yes sir so it's the process of heat transfer in which heat directly passes from one body to the other body without affecting the medium without the requirement of the medium so no medium is required for the heat transfer by the process of radiation and in vacuum heat transfer takes place only by the process of radiation okay now also the heat energy that is transferred by the process of radiation is called as radiant heat the heat that is transferred by the process of radiation that is called as radiant heat got it now or sometime also we can call this as thermal radiation okay talking about the nature of this radiant heat so this heat energy is as it is transferred by the radiation so it is transferred in the form of electromagnetic waves it is transferred in the form of electromagnetic waves getting it guys and these waves can even travel in the vacuum as we know and they travel in all directions in a straight line with a speed equivalent to speed of light what i'm saying that these electromagnetic waves now it will be traveling in all the directions in the straight line with a speed equal to that of speed of light what is the speed of light 